A research group from Canada and South Korea have developed a new high-performance material. It is as strong as carbon steel and as light as polystyrene. This combination could enable ultra-lightweight components and with that save a lot of fuel. In an aircraft, for example, up to 80 liters per year can be saved for every kilogram that is reduced. And a passenger plane today often weighs several hundred tons. So there is a lot of potential. What kind of material it is, what the differences are to conventional alternatives and how great its potential really is, that's what we're going to talk about now and with that, welcome to the German Science Guy. I'm Dr. Jakob Botton and in Germany we say Los geht's. Making heavy things lighter saves energy and conserves resources. For example, if a car is 100 kilograms lighter, it consumes around half a liter less per 100 kilometers. Doesn't sound like much at first, but in Germany, we collectively drive over 582 billion kilometers per year. If all cars were 100 kilograms lighter, we would save an average of more than 2.9 billion liters of fuel. An Airbus A320 even saves almost 10,000 liters of kerosene per 100 kilograms less weight. This is why lightweight construction is extremely important. A new ultralight material is now coming from Canada and South Korea. Basically, this is a nano-architecture material. Such materials combine high-performance shapes, such as the triangular shape of bridges, on a nano level. The principle of smaller is stronger applies here. This principle that metal structures become stronger the smaller they are was discovered over 60 years ago. As a result, some of the highest strength to weight and stiffness to weight ratios are achieved at nano level. And this means that nanomaterials with high performance shapes have a very low material density but are very strong. The research teams from Canada and South Korea wanted to achieve precisely these properties. Their starting material was polymer-based, so it was composed of many identical units to form a molecule. To produce this strong but also super light material, they combined two methods. The finite element method and the Bayesian optimization. Sounds more complicated than it actually is. The finite element method, or FEM for short, can be thought of as a computer-aided tool. It can be used to simulate and analyze technical products. This includes new ultralight materials. The FEM uses mathematical and physical equations to describe material problems and external influencing factors, for example. For example, something like fluid pressure, temperature or vibration. You can really introduce a lot of variables and also specifically examine which aspects you want to investigate. You can also find out what loads the material will be exposed to and how well it handles real-life situations such as transportation or assembly. This allows you to optimize performance, costs and safety while also reducing development time. And instead of looking at the big whole model, the finite element method looks at the small units of the model. And these small units are the finite elements. That's where the name comes from. You look precisely at these small elements because it is much easier to calculate their behavior than that on the entire model. In FEM, a large complex problem is divided into many small simple problems. We then put all the individual element equations back together again at the end to create a system equation. This then takes all variables into account and the result is our finished model. This equation can of course be further optimized according to your own wishes. And the research team have also done this with the help of multi-objective Bayesian optimization. This is not a new method in itself, but the combination with the finite element method was previously rather atypical. So the basic idea of Bayesian optimization is to make complex functions simpler. To do this, the approach usually uses a Gaussian process, so a random process from probability theory. This shows us which data we already know and which we are still missing. The acquisition function is particularly helpful here. The data points are distributed in a large space. You have to imagine it like objects in space. Each data point offers different possibilities. Some points in space improve our model, others do not. An acquisition function can help us to find exactly those points in space that are important for our model. In this way, we can continue to improve the model and we do this until a specific condition is met. 
Together with the Gaussian process, it forms the core of Bayesian optimization. This is exactly what the research teams did. Once they had found a point in space that they found interesting, they used it to update their model. They then ran the finite element method over this updated model again and fed the data back into the Bayesian optimization. So the whole thing was a cycle, alternating between these two methods. The research teams repeated this process over and over again until they had integrated 100 additional data points into their model. So in the end, they simply kept improving the model and with that, the results. And the results were quite impressive. The study investigated nano-architectural carbon materials, in particular, paralyzed carbon nanogrids. Paralyzed means that it is decomposed at high temperatures in an oxygen-free environment. This produces a material that is rich in carbon and has a net-like structure. Combining the finite element method and Bayesian optimization, they have not only improved the properties of the carbon nanogrids, the result also represents an important step forward in the development and optimization of such nanoarchitectural materials. The combination enabled the research group to significantly improve the mechanical properties. The stiffness of the material improved by 68% and the strength by as much as 118%. However, the research team first had to transfer these theoretical improvements to the real world. To do this, they put the starting material to two-photon polymerization. In this process, a precisely focused laser hardens liquid and light-sensitive polymers, creating a nanogrid structure. A pyrolysis process was also used, in which the researchers converted the polymer into carbon at high temperatures. The result was an optimized carbon nanogrid with a compressive strength of 180 to 360 megapascal, which corresponds to that of carbon steel and a density of just 125 to 215 kilograms per cubic meter. And maybe you're all like me and ask yourself, 125 kilograms per cubic meter sounds like a lot at first, but these are specialized forms of polystyrene, for example. I found that polystyrene, which is used, for example, for helmets, has a density of 90 to 100 kilograms per cubic meter, while that used in construction is more like 15 kg per cubic meter. The researchers may have played with a very light image in the paper for effect, but if you then see that the density of carbon steel is around 8000 kg per cubic meter, you can see that it is really amazing what they have achieved, simply a density that is almost 64 times lower with the same strength. So the material is not only strong, but also extremely light. But as always, new approaches always have a few troubles and we need to talk about that too. Before that, why don't you quickly subscribe and activate the bell so you don't miss any more videos and support this very young channel. Okay, so this brings us to the big but or the big problem as sometimes we call it, which you already know from my videos. In every video we look at the critical points because that is what you have to do. And of course in every video you can see the sources for everything I say down here. So let's start. Because as great as the results sound at first, there are still a few challenges with the process. For example, with the finite element method, although we can use it to model a lot and simulate real conditions, it also has its limits. There are size-dependent effects that the finite element method cannot capture. This is a problem at the nano level in particular. But the biggest problem lies in the scaling. Until now, it has simply taken an extremely long time to produce such nanogrid structures. This is a problem. Pyrolysis in particular needs to be optimized so that the mechanical performance of these nanogrids can be transferred to large areas of application. And also there's a problem that the quality of the materials in bigger scales is not the same everywhere, so errors are a problem. Nevertheless, the new material shows what is possible and the problems are not completely unsolvable. This approach of combining the two methods is still relatively new. But basically, it's super exciting because you can just see we actually already have good methods that when combined open up completely new possibilities. We may not even have some of them on our radar yet and we can really look forward to seeing which approaches will perhaps be combined in the future and what will emerge. What do you think of this new development? and how awesome would it be if we could suddenly build so many lighter and at the same time more stable airplanes and other vehicles. Write your opinion in the comments and if you want so, here is another video of the German science guy. I say vielen Dank, which means thank you very much in German and I say goodbye oder auf Wiedersehen.